This is lecture 14 uh, for Bio 410, 510, Bioinformatics at California State University, Monterey Bay. Uh, and today's topic will be um, a presentation on the applications and issues associated with genome assemblies, as well as an exploration of some of the algorithms and approaches that we take when we do genome assemblies. Uh, so if we think about a genome assembly, um, what we're going to be talking about mostly today are what we refer to as de novo genome assemblies or assemblies uh, from new. So these are novel assemblies, assemblies that haven't been done before. There's no other reference assembly. Um, and this is an attempt to accurately represent an entire genome sequence for a large set of very short DNA sequences. Uh, if you want to think of what it means to do a genome assembly it's kind of like doing a giant jigsaw puzzle um, where you're trying to take all these different sequences or reads and fit them together in other words find where they overlap with each other to form larger contiguous pieces fill in all get all the puzzle pieces to fit together and put together uh, a larger genome sequence uh, one of the things about this puzzle is you could have all kinds of missing pieces due to sequencing bias. You could have um, some pieces that are dirty and you can't tell what they are because there could be sequencing errors. Uh, and there are a whole other host of other issues that can complicate this process. Um, throughout this presentation, uh, I've borrowed a bunch of information from presentations by Torsten Seaman and uh, Keith Bradne uh, Bradnam at UC Davis. Um, I really just uh, think that they had some great ways of talking about um, some of the issues and, uh, and um, problems associated with genome assembly and uh, had a really nice presentation. So I used some of their materials. So um, when we talk about genome assembly, uh, if we can take an example here, which is a, sort of an example of a small genome, <clears throat> um, we get some Shakespeare omics going on here. You know, we have a Shakespeare quote, friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. And if we were to break this up into sequencing reads, you know, we, we could end up with something that looks like this, where we have these different sequencing segments. And uh, what we're going to want to do is uh, see if we can assemble them back into that small genome that we had previously. One of the things that we can do is we can start to overlap the sections that match with each other so that we can form um, a larger contiguous segment. Uh, but notice that, you know, sometimes when we do this process, we could end up with a couple of errors that we see here in yellow. So we have a a C where we might see a T and an S where we might see expect to see an L. From this um, overlap of these different reads, these different segments of text, right, we can then compress them down and form a majority consensus where we use, um, we collapse the columns of this alignment down, right, and we call all the letters that we have in our overlaps. And note that where we do have some disagreement, um, we'll use the majority call. So a T in countrymen and count over well the C in crimen, and the L in la and lend override the S in send. And we can recreate this small genome. So that's a very simple case, right? Seems pretty straightforward. Well, you know, if you ask world leaders in genome assembly, they'll tell you uh, it's kind of an impossible task doing genome assembly. And while not impossible, it is uh, incredibly difficult. Um, so there's a lot of components to it. We've come a long way in how, we've, in how we do it. Um, and we've solved all kinds of problems through the evolution of technology and bioinformatics tools, but it still is not for the faint of heart. So what is a genome assembly? Well, if I had to define it, um, I like this definition of a genome assembly. A genome assembly is an attempt to accurately represent an entire genome sequence from a large set of very short DNA sequences. And so one of the nice things about this definition is it highlights some of the things that are important. So first off, this is definitely an attempt, right? Um, this is like running an experiment. So if you're going to do an assembly, you have to understand that um, just because you get an answer, it doesn't necessarily mean you get the right answer, right? 
So you should always prepare to reevaluate your experiment, tweak some of the parameters and rerun it to get do a better job. Um, it's uh, supposed to accurately represent an entire genome sequence. So the ideal goal here would be to get complete sequences for each chromosome at each level of ploidy. So in other words, if we were to assemble a diploid genome, we would end up with two sets of genome sequences. It is incredibly rare that that is actually the case, but that's what we would want to try to accomplish. And that's our goal. Um, we're generating it from a large set. And when we say large, uh, this is a relative term. It can depend, and it sort of depends on the size of the genome sequence that you're trying to sequence. But basically means that the number of sequence needed to assemble a genome is, is going to be a lot, is going to be very many. <laughs> um, um, hopefully over time, you know, we'll see advances increase and we'll get, we'll need less and less sequences to actually assemble genomes. Maybe someday we'll only need one. Uh, but for now, it's going to be a lot. And that's why this is definitely a field for big data scientists. Um, when we say that it's a very short DNA sequences, this is also a relative term. Um, and as technology improves, we would expect to be, see these sequences get longer and longer. Right? Um, but for now, the sequences are much shorter than the genomes that we're actually trying to assemble. So if we want to think of a nice metaphor, uh, it's a bit like trying to do the hardest jigsaw puzzle you can imagine. So, you know, um, we're trying to put these pieces together to form the picture of what is the genome sequence. Um, and, you know, jigsaws are a nice analogy in this case, nice metaphor. Um, we can have segments that we want to um, assemble that are sort of misplaced, right? And, and uh, they're free floating, they they're not anchored anywhere. Um, and as we for the, form these sort of small segments of this puzzle, which we would refer to as contigs or contiguous sequences, um, we might try to figure out how we could take these misplaced or these um, unplaced pieces of this uh, uh, picture and anchor them in a place that would make sense. Um, and that is a step that many finished genome actually never get to. So it's not uncommon to end up with something like this where we actually don't know you know, what chromosome or what position a specific point of DNA sequence ends up on. Um, however, if we can figure out, uh, maybe we use a reference sequence so we know something about the picture or the box, right? Or we can use colors, you know, sequence, sequences, syntenic regions that we know that are conserved among species to try to organize these things a little bit better if we can. So we're going to keep working on our jigsaw puzzle and you know we might look at some of the regions that are a little bit more problematic like the regions that are um, uh, involved in uh, say the ocean or other sort of areas that look pretty this pretty similar to each other well in genomes this represent this would represent uh, repetitive regions regions where the dna is just repeating itself and in this case we can make that look like something like the sea or the sky or, or something where there's no defining characteristic to make it easy to put together. And uh, this is one of the hardest regions of a genome to actually um, assemble. Uh, and it's typically the, 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 these repetitive regions are what make DNA's frag, assemblies fragmented when we try to put them together. One thing we can do is we can use um, any information we can get um, to try to help them pair regions together. You know, we might use something like this, the Golden Gate Bridge here, and say, oh yeah, these two sections are right next to each other, right? Or we might use paired ends when we sequence um, in order to um, take these two pieces and say that they're approximately a certain, a certain distance from each other. And in assembly jargon, we refer to these two contiguous sequences of these two contigs now being joined together as scaffolds. So it's not uncommon that we would have a sort of a specific region where we might not know what the sequence is, but we know about approximately how much space there is uh, in that region. So, you know, as we go through and we assemble, we continue to work on our genome assembly. We start to fill in the pieces, we fill in the pieces, and then we get to a point where we, we might wonder, you know, is this a good enough sequence? Is this what we want? Um, are we done? And you might look at this and say, well, we're not done. The picture's incomplete. Um, 
but you know for all the things that are missing here you know we've got the edges we've got a good sense of what the overall picture looks like we know this is san francisco you know most of the things we're meeting are really just kind of minor effects to the overall picture so you know, from a, a genome sequencing perspective this is actually pretty decent um you know it's not uncommon to have missing pieces or We've got mistakes where we've tried to jam a piece in where it shouldn't be or it looks wrong. Um, and so, you know, something like this that we're looking at is actually pretty rare when we get a sequence that looks this good. Um, you know, sometimes we end up with sequences too where we're just never going to find that thing because the sequence technologies we're using to capture that region just are biased against it. So, you know, a complete and perfect genome sequence, there are very few examples of this. Prokaryotic genome sequences, maybe, but for eukaryotic ones, pretty rare that we ever get think that we have a complete genome sequence. Maybe yeast or worms, those are probably our, our best examples of near complete reference genome sequences. So why is it so difficult? What's what's the what makes it so hard? Well, let's think about the largest genomes assembled first. So back in um, 2014, Lob Lolly Pine was A number one coming out of UC Davis. Uh, this was a 22 gigabase um, genome, so 22 billion bases per long. That thing was about 80% repetitive. That's a lot of repeats, right? It's hard to assemble. And it was probably more repetitive than that, but they couldn't even resolve all the repeats because of how difficult the genome was to assemble. And to do that, they did 64x coverage of the genome. So they covered, they generated 22 gigabases of data times 64 in order to uh, generate this genome sequence. So they generated an incredible amount of data sequence to generate this genome sequence. But, you know, who cares about 32? Let's uh, up the ante here. Uh, and then there's the axolotl genome, which was published, um, you know, a few years after. Uh, uh, part of uh, Eugene Meyer's uh, contributions, um, the axolotl is a pedomorphic um, amphibian salamander uh, with a genome of approximately 32 gigabases. Um, here they identified uh, only about 66% of the genome to be repetitive, probably an underestimation. Um, and they, they had 32x coverage of this genome. But why stop at 32x coverage? Let's go all the way to uh, 43. So now the largest genome sequence recently published just this past January um, is the Australian lungfish. Um, this is a lobed fish, so um, uh, sort of thought to be some of the ants, ants, uh, ancestral fish that were related to those that crawled out of the ocean onto land. And this genome here um, was about uh, 43 gigabases long. And they ended up uh, being able to estimate it to be 90% repetitive. Um, what was unique about this is they only used Oxford nanopore data for this genome assembly. Uh, so they were able to generate sequences that were a lot longer than um, uh, Illumina sequencing, which is often what's used. Uh, it was about 28x coverage. It took about 100,000 computing hours to do the assembly uh, for this project. Um, and some of the co-authors on this project included um, Axel Meyer and Manfred Chardel, who actually is um, uh, interested and in, in a collaborator on the genome assembly project we'll be working on this class. So what does it mean to have 20x, 32, or 64x coverage? Uh, well, if we were to think about the law of lolly pine, that would mean that you would have generated about 1.4 trillion base pairs of DNA sequence. In each of, this, each of these cases, you were over a trillion base pairs, by the way. Um, that's an incredible amount of sequence. It's a lot of information and data, right? Um, and if you want to think of what that means for the loblolly pine, that means that they had to use 64 times as much input DNA as they ended up in, ended up with in the final output. 
It's like taking a cake and using 64 times the ingredients in order to make one cake, right? And, you know, usually most, you know, sequencing projects are around uh, more than 100x coverage in terms of the amount of DNA that they need to create. These genomes were so large, they didn't even get close to it. But it's, it's, it takes a lot of sequencing to accomplish these things. And even in all these cases, we're probably looking at, um, you know, pretty incomplete uh, jigsaw puzzles when we look at them. What are the challenges here? Well, as I said before, repeats are a big challenge. Um, ploidy is a big issue. The amount of heterozygosity you have in a system in a species can, can really be a big inhibitor of our ability to generate a good contiguous sequence. Uh, and the, the fact that we're doing this without any reference, without knowing what the answer is to the problem makes it incredibly difficult. Um, there are some cases, you know, where things like ploidy especially are more problematic. Plants are uh, especially problematic when it comes to this. You know, you have species like wheat and strawberries that can be like hexaploid or worse. Um, and so it becomes very difficult to disentangle each of these different sets of chromosomes from each other. Um, if you do have a reference, it can make it a lot easier to generate a genome sequence because uh, we can just map our data to that reference. But for the most part, what we're talking about here is going to be de novo genome assembly, which is much, much more difficult. So imagine you had, uh, you know, your, your puzzle that you're trying to make, but, you know, instead of um, having this nice little picture of what we might expect, Right? When we're looking to assemble genomes, you know, we, we may not know anything about what to expect. It's like assembling a jigsaw without a puzzle, without a picture. Um, maybe we have some related species to this, uh, the one, to our target species. So we might have a little bit of a semblance of what that picture should look like, but it's going to be pretty blurred and may or may not be all that helpful. Uh, if we're lucky to, um, we may or may not know how many pieces are actually going into our genome assembly. Um, whether or not we actually know the size of our genome and how many pieces, therefore, it would take to assemble that genome uh, is often undetermined. Um, and some of the methods that tell us this can not always be all that accurate. You know, we can generate them computationally, and we'll talk about that more when we talk about KMERS. Um, but there's a lot of people that don't trust those estimates. Um, and if we look at even genome size estimates that have been recorded for, you know, a commonly measured species like a mouse, you can see that over the course of history, there have been a lot of very, a lot of variable um, reports on what is the actual genome size of mice. And this is mouse. Like if we're seeing this much variation in mice where we have multiple measures, what about other organisms when we only have one measure if we're lucky? Additionally, there's a host of other challenges, practical challenges that can come about. You know, there's the cost of a genome. It's estimated that we got to a thousand dollar genome back in 2014. Uh, it hasn't really changed the cost over that time, just so you know, since then. Um, and whether or not we're truly at a thousand dollar genome, it remains to be seen because, you know, it may be easy to generate the sequence nowadays, but it's not easy to install, to uh, analyze it and understand it. Um, library prep is a really important part of genome sequencing and often overlooked. Um, the better hands you have in the lab, the better data that you'll be able to generate. Uh, we've got a lot of diversity of sequences, so it can often be challenging to figure out how to combine sequencing from different platforms. Um, you need, generally will need some specialized hardware in order to accomplish these tasks. And one of the big issues, too, that you have is that there's just a lot of software out there for doing this stuff. And understanding which software to pick and in which case is a really challenging thing. So, you know, just say you look at a piece of software like this price assembly software. It has 52 command line options just for one uh, piece of software. That's a lot of command line options. And um, what it does is it just, it's not that it doesn't need them, but it does speak to the fact that um, there's a lot of complex uh, solutions out there in genome assembly. Uh, 
Uh, and do you really have time to explore all these complex outcomes? It can be very challenging and daunting and intimidating trying to look at them all. Um, and often to do genome assemblies, you know, we're not just using one tool. So if we look at what I consider to be probably the gold standard for assembly processes right now, which is the, the pipeline associated with the Vertebra Genome Project, you know, you can see that we're having to do a whole bunch of steps. We're using multiple different data types. We're using different programs, Falcon and PurgeDupe, and a scaffolding program for 10X, Salsa, Aero, Long Ranger, Freebase. We're doing a whole series of different steps in each, running different software in each one of these steps to generate this process and um, also evaluate them in each step as well. So it just becomes a pretty long, laborious process and, you know, there's not just one tool that we know about. We need to know about this whole pipeline, right, uh, of what's going on to really understand how to troubleshoot and address problems as they arise in this process. Um, so dealing with this software question is not an inconsequential one and perhaps one of the hardest ones to really understand as someone starting out in the field and as, even as someone who continues to work in the field. Um, so if you were using a pretty old list, um, there's already, they were already in, my, so back in like 2014-15, um, you'd already have about 200 and 125 different tools available for um, being used in genome assembly. Um, you know, some of them are specific to specific parts of the genome assembly, others are for um, evaluating genome assemblies, but you know, just figuring out how to pick a tool out of this sort of sea of different tools uh, becomes really uh, challenging, right? Like, I don't know which one to use. Do you know which one to use? You know, do I have to test them all to know which one to use? It gets to be um, pretty daunting. And this slide was made in 2014. You just imagine how many different tools there are now. And you can look at something just specific. So, you know, in like one month in 2014, there were four different, uh, sorry, six different assembly tools published, right? And so this, there are tons of, uh, tools being delivered every single uh, year or month um, and so it's incredibly difficult to keep track of what's useful and what's not useful and the fact that is that you know even before you start to assemble you're gonna have to use some of these tools so you know we we did a little bit of this in class where we used uh, Trimomatic to remove um, some adapter contamination and uh, trim out low quality regions and assess them in FASTQC, right? So you have to take these steps beforehand. Um, but how straightforward is this process? I showed you, you know, how to use Trimomatic, but if you want to remove, if you just want to remove adapters, there's at least 34 different tools you could use to do so. And one of these tools has 27 different command line options. like. How do you know how to proceed when that's the case? Which of these 34 do I use? Which of these 27 command line options are important to me? So, you know, if you really want to dig in deep and explore all these things, you could be at it for a very, very long time. So, you know, again, why is all this in part important about genome assembly? Well, you know, assemblies are incredibly important for us to understand the biology of organisms. We look back to the original sequence of um, yeast, uh, which is a very small genome, only about 12 megabases, um, first published back in 1997, its first eukaryotic gene published. But one thing to note is that even though it's got this small genome, you know, that genome uh, was actually uh, revised multiple times and corrected in a variety of different ways. And, uh, you know, not even just the genome sequence, but how we call and identify genes in it has been um, continuing to be evolved over time. We think about another, you know, model species, one that doesn't have a huge genome, right? The first plant genome sequence, the most, uh, the best studied genetic plant group, uh, Arabidopsis thaliana, right? You can see that, you know, even through time, the genome size has been fluctuating and changing. Right now, it, it, we think it's more about 119 megabases. Um, but you can see that there's there's still uncertainty in some of these genome sequences, even if they're really from species we, we, we know really well. And this includes the human genome sequence. So, you know, it's about 
three gigabases, that's so about three billion base pairs long, so pretty big genome. Um, when it was first published in 2000, we had a working draft in 2001, and then it was announced to be complete in 2003, and it was published in 2004, but was it really complete? Was it really done? Um, there have been multiple versions of the human genome that have come out since. There are still regions that are not sequenced of the human genome, like this, like most of the centromeric sequences of the human genome. Uh, there were mistakes there. There were contaminations. There were all kinds of issues with this genome. So it, it's, I don't know, it's, it's probably pretty near completion, but now they're even thinking about, well, what does it really mean to have one genome sequence? Or we, should we really be looking at what they referred to as the pan genome, so the patterns of diversity that we see across all uh, Homo sapiens. Needless to say, uh, this is an area of active research, right? It's an area of active pursuit of knowledge because it's not just one thing that's driving this process. And so there are a lot of ongoing sequencing projects, and this is just one example. These are just some of the examples of these guys, right? So. Um, BAT2K, Vertebrate Genome Project, Earth Bio Genome Project, which I think are sort of two of the um, big drivers in this movement now, along with the Darwin Tree of Life group. Um, and if you want to get more into the bio, uh, biomedical area, you might think about, you know, work in autism and cancer, as well as the All of Us um, uh, project run by the NIH. Um, but there's a lot of other smaller programs, including our own in California, the California Conservation Genomics Project, um, which is mostly run through the UCs right now. Uh, but if you want to see what these are, you can go to the Earth Bio Genome Project website, and um, there you'll see all the different types of um, uh, projects that are currently active and identified. And this is not even necessarily a complete one, but you'll start to notice that there are you know, projects associated with specific regions, right? So there's Bridge Columbia, there's the Canadian Genome Projects, California, um, Catalan, uh, there is um, uh, some projects that are specifically located uh, and run out of China um, for Australian plants. Like you get these very specific groups Right, and these are specifically meant um, to address, you know, taxa to generate genome sequences for taxa that are of principal concern to these groups. So, a lot of really interesting projects that are up and running and uh, providing a, a really explosion of um, gen uh, genomic resources uh, across the world. So, you know, uh, we're generating more and more sequences. Um, and one of the things that uh, uh, is going to be really informative is that the, the, I expect these genome sequences to have a huge impact on our understanding of the, the, um, uh, how biology really functions across large organisms and the evolution of them large numbers of organisms and the evolution of them. You know, the Vertebrate Genome Project is, is targeted to, to try to sequence all vertebrate genomes at basically uh, a near no error level. So a true reference genome sequence. So all 70,000 vertebrate species. Or in the Earth Bio Genome Project, you know, they're trying to generate genome sequences for all 1.5 million um, species on Earth. So really interesting work, um, really dynamic. I think we're gonna see big changes in the years to come. And another cool thing is, you know, we no longer just have one genome per species. Uh, you know, we have genome sequences representing different strains and varieties of species. Uh, in the vertebrate genome group, we've started, you know, sequencing trios, mother, father, and offspring in order that we are able to generate, you know, the haploid genome sequences from the offspring. Um, so we've also got, you know, genome sequences now for multiple individuals. We've got them for uh, multiple tissues, especially in cancer, right? And, you know, sometime in the near future, you might just be getting your genome sequence at birth and then uh, have sort of genome health checks throughout your life. So I think genome sequencing is going to, we're going to see more 
widely applied um, in areas related to personalized medicine. So one thing to say is that, you know, what's the point of generating all this data if we can't actually assemble them well, right? And um, sequencing is actually pretty easy, but the analysis and putting them together, not so much. Um, so what are some of the approaches that we take when it comes to genome assembly? Well, um, when we think about de novo assembly approaches, a classical way of approaching it is through something called hierarchical sequencing. Right, and this is sort of what we would refer to as a tap top-down or map base or clone by clone strategy. And what we basically do is we take a genome, we break it up into smaller and smaller units um, that it's very important that we know where they come from in the genome, right? And then once we've got them into the appropriate size, then we sequence them. And then we take those sequences and we assemble these different pools of um, uh, uh, sequences into contiguous uh, sequence and eventually um, into these contiguous regions. What are some of the benefits? Um, well, because of how we actually create these libraries and the sequencing pools, um, we have a really good sense of where in the genome those sequences come from. So we can map them pretty easily. It reduces a bunch of repetitive effort. And um, it's a tried and true method. It's how we generated all the first sets of genome sequences. Um, so you end up with a, a really nice high confidence genome sequence. Uh, some of the cost for this is that it's super expensive and it's super time consuming, right? It takes a lot of work and a lot of money to do it this way. You know, the first human genome was, was you know, uh, it cost an incredible amount of money to generate. And so, um, there's got to be a better way, and that's what technology brought us through the advent of shotgun sequencing. So in this case, uh, to do shotgun sequencing, you just take it, you skip a bunch of steps, you just take your genome, you break it up in tiny pieces, you sequence it, and you assemble it. Um, it sounds easy, but it's uh, it's a lot more complicated than that. Um, but basically, we're going to use some computer algorithms to take all these reads and assemble them into contigs or contiguous sequence, and um, that's going to, those are going to be formed by taking these sequences and overlapping and aligning them to each other so that we can overlap them and join them together. Uh, what are the benefits? It's cheap, it's fast, um, but the costs include the fact that this is computationally kind of complex, takes a lot of work, can be very difficult to assess, and um, the biases in any one process are often seen as being unclear. Uh, and then also understanding there's just some parts of the genome that may never actually assemble and we're going to have to just accept that. So when we think about the shotgun sequencing assembly approaches, there's um, a bunch of different ways of approaching it. I'm going to talk about four of them. Uh, the greedy assembly, the overlap consensus, and the Bruyne graphs and string graphs. And um, they're all take basically doing the same thing, but taking different types of shortcuts. So the goal is always the same, to generate a consensus sequence for a certain amount of data. But how they go about doing that can be very different. So when you think about greedy assembly, basically this is finding two sequences where the largest overlaps merge them. Um, and then you just keep on repeating that process. Um, and one of the things is because we're always targeting the largest thing, um, and favoring for longer things, um, it can lead to a process that is prone for misassembly. Overlap layout consensus involves taking all pairs of sequences that have some overlap in them, defined amount of overlap, and then removing the redundant and weak overlaps, then taking those pairs of sequences and then merging them to other similar groups until um, that overlap is unambiguous. And um, once we have all these uh, uh, sequences merged together into these more contiguous groups, uh, then we use that majority consensus calling process that we talked about earlier with the Shakespeare example. Um, when we think about these overla that this overlap process, um, I think it's important to introduce the fact that almost all assembly uh, problems are presented as um, graphs. And uh, graph theory is imp 
incredibly important in, in genome assembly and assembly algorithms, um, but it's not necessarily a data analysis or data treatment um, uh, um, approach emphasized in our undergraduate education, right? But basically, we want to visualize and, and take all of our data and put it into this type of model, right? And the model is one in which uh, every sequence is a vertex and every overlap is an edge. So if we think about these two sequences, U and V, they're connected by um, some sort of overlap, and that's this TGCT, GCC, GCC region. And what does that mean in practice? Well, when we apply it to sequences, we can take some random sequences, we can identify the overlaps, and then based upon those overlaps, we'll form a pretty complex uh, graph. And then once we form that graph, we'll work our way through it, um, identifying something called the Hamiltonian Peninsula, which will help us order um, and connect these um, uh, sequences together, eventually generating a consensus sequence. Um, how do you find read overlaps? Um, basically, if you have n reads of length n, we just have to do a whole bunch of comparisons, half n um, times n minus 1. Um, and then once we find them, then we'll do some uh, use some thresholds and some other uh, evaluations to basically um, assess whether or not uh, we've got some good matches. Um, Often some rules we might pick for overlapping are like, you know, they overlap by 20 bases, they're 95% similar, uh, things of that sort. And in the end, hopefully you end up with something like this, which looks pretty gnarly to look at, but the computer can do a good job of reducing this down and actually co collecting, um, uh, compressing these down into a uh, consensus sequence. A de Bruijn graph is another uh, really important approach implemented in genome assembly. Um, de Bruijn graphs are a particular kind of overlap graph. Um, here, every vertex is a string of length k or a kamer, and every edge is the overlap of length k minus one. So if I was looking at six mers, um, every edge would be a five mer. Um, and this is a pretty quick process to bring the Brillian processes are um, speedy in their calculations. Um, and basically, you know, when we have a read of length L, it's going to have um, L minus K plus 1 K mer. So if I had 6 mers, and my, or if I had 9 mers, and my sequence was um, uh, 12 reads long, right, it's going to be 9 minus 12 plus 4. So that means there's going to be 4 sequences, uh, uh, 4 input reads. Um, for the my kamers. Uh, so just like before, each kamer is a vertex uh, in the de Bruijn graph, and um, adjacent kamers are basically connected through edges on the de Bruijn graph. So in this case, you can see, you know, we've got sequence one, A, T, C, A, T, uh, A, C, A, T, right? It overlaps here, and so these two are connected, uh, to these two vertices are connected by an edge. Same here and here. Um, so, um, just taking a look at a graph, you know, what happens when we do these debris graphs is we can actually have them diverge from each other, right? So we can see that as we go through, it's basically the same sequence, and then we get to divergent outcomes, they'll actually diverge from each other. We can have them connect where they play together, um, but you have to make that choice. Again, you're going to um, generate, do a similar process of what we did with the overlap consensus approach. Um, and generating this larger path graph that we're going to uh, have to find a um, pathway through. Um, so graphs are really powerful. They're really great, but they're not perfect. They can cause all other kinds of problems, and those problems are related often to the nature of the data. How good is the data that we got, and uh, how timely was it used, things like that. Um, but some of the things that can ruin these graphs include read errors, heterozygosity, repeats. The same things that we talked about before being really challenging when it comes to um, genome assembly. And what they do is they tend to cause bubbles and spurs in your um, actual path graph. Uh, 
And so one of the ways to, to deal with this is to do something called graph simplification, where we take bubbles and we squash them, and we take spurs and we cut them out. Um, and we can also do things that try to join um, unambiguously connected nodes. So nodes that we know are, um, are vertices we know that should be connected. As I said before, when we generate these genome sequences, one of the things that we are doing is we're trying to generate contiguous um, sections and of these overlap gene uh, uh, DNA sequences. And we generally refer to these things as contigs. These are contiguous, unambiguous stretches of assembled DNA sequence. And over here, we have an example of where we have contig 1 and contig 2 and contig 3. So each one of these would be represented by one sequence. But notice that um, we've got contig 1 and contig 2, contig 2 both connecting to the beginning of contig 3, which may not, you know, maybe this is variation between the two copies of the genome, or maybe it's something very different. Um, but basically the um, contig ends typically correspond to either real ends, um, dead ends, or missing sequence, or sort of these, these kinds of decision points um, in our uh, row presentation. Um, we've talked a lot about repeats. Uh, they can be problematic in genome assembly. Um, a repeat, again, is going to be defined as a segment of DNA which occurs more than once in the genome sequence. Um, there's all kinds of repeats that we have that are very common in our genomes, transposons, satellites, gene duplications. And basically one of the problems when we do repeat assembly is that yeah, you've got these repeats there, you've got these reads that basically look exactly the same. Like there's not much to, to help it assemble in this region. So instead, um, they often get collapsed into these consensus sequences and we end up with gaps in our sequence because we can't reliably call upon them. Um, one of the things that can help uh, resolve repeats is uh, having actual reads that are longer than the repeat. Um, and this used to be a, re a big um, issue in the uh, uh, assembly world, but with the advent of uh, a bunch of new technologies, it's become less and less of an issue. Um, again, I mentioned earlier that heterozygosity can be a problem when doing genome assembly. And what you can see here is what heterozygosity can often do where we have variable sites. It can lead to fragmentation, especially when the reads are short. So it's unclear whether or not this, this heterozygous region should be placed in this specific spot because there's not a whole lot of evidence suggesting that these are overlapping and well-placed, but we know that each of these two are different sequences. This is one of the ways that long reads can help resolve is it basically shows that these um, variable regions are actually well placed within the actual genome. Um, and uh, one of the things that long reads do is they allow us to do things like untangle sort of gnarly graphs where we have little bubbles or spurs on them, right? So if we get the longer sequence, um, over time we'll eventually um, be able to uh, trim out some of these difficult uh, parts. Um, one thing uh, it's always to remember, it's important, is to remember the law of repeats. So it's impossible to resolve repeats of length s unless you have reads longer than s. And it's also impossible to resolve repeats of length s unless you have reads longer than s. Get it? <laughs> um, so, but it's a, it's a good thing to point to, right? So we need to see what's on these edges, the other side of these edges, to be able to effectively resolve these um, repeats. Uh, along with uh, contiguous sequence and repeats, um, there's an important concept of scaffolding. So when we talk about scaffolding, we're talking about moving beyond contigs. So contig sizes are typically limited by the length of repeats in our genome and um, the length of the reads that we're using. Uh, so they have some sort of relationship to that. Um, and there are ways to get around both these issues. Um, but one of the ways is to think about how we're actually using the sequencing reads that we're generating. So nowadays, you know, we can generate um, single end reads that range anywhere from 200 to 100 of thousands of KB if you're using, if you're really good at min-ion sequencing. Um, 
you know, the classic um, DNA sequence we use for a lot of our work is going to be paired in sequencing, which are usually about 75 or 300 base pairs where we have a segment of DNA that can be up to say like a um, thousand or so base pairs long. And we have the beginning of it, um, the five prime end uh, identified for sequencing and the end of it identified for sequencing. Um, and this is a helpful process by which we can get uh, more coverage of the entire genome. For mate pair, it's a similar process, but the reads are pointed the other direction, and we can go as much as a 40,000 base pair difference between uh, these two. So this is for looking at uh, slightly larger um, targets. Uh, there is also some methods um, related to um, uh, something called HI-C, which is a specific method that allows us to sample even farther away from each other. So in this case, we have paired reads that can be up to hundreds of thousands of kilobases apart from each other. So one of the things that we typically want to do is once we have our contigs assembled, then we're actually going to want to put them together into, into scaffolds, where we're going to anchor them together. And to do that, we'll use things like paired reads in a case where we might have a read that maps to one spot and maps to another spot on a different um, a different contig. So uh, we also have cases where we could have, you know, mate pair reads that are farther apart um, that map to each other. And then because we know they're connected, we know that these two um, sequences could be connected as well. You know, like this, this process of going to scaffolds has changed over time. Nowadays, if you're doing something like the vertebrate genome or or Earth Biology Genome Project. Um, there's a bunch of different data types that you can use to accomplish this. So, you know, we have our contigs, and then we can use something like BioNano optical maps or high C reads to basically generate these chromosome level scaffolds, which are pretty cool. So, how do we figure out if we did a good job, right? This was kind of the crux of it. You know, like we, we've talked a lot about the different methodologies, but have we actually been successful. Um, and so, to assess that, you know, we kind of have to know the total length, um, uh, you know, of our assemblies. We want it to be pretty close to our genome size. We don't want it to be the, to be many contigs. In a perfect world, we'd have all our chromosomes represented, um, and we don't really want, and we don't mind any mistakes, especially misassemblies, like things that might lead us down the wrong path. Um, what metrics could we use to measure this? Uh, there are a lot of them, right? But they tend to vary from a lab to lab in terms of what they think is important. Uh, the most commonly used one is probably the N50 statistic. Uh, and this is a statistic used to measure the cons contiguity of an assembly, first associated with the human genome paper. And basically it's the length of a sequence which takes the sum length of all sequences past 50% of the total assembly size. So yeah, you probably didn't get that, but if you want to think of a, of a good example, right? Again, N50 is the length of the contig from which 50% of the bases are in it and uh, shorter contigs. So um, here, if we can imagine, we've got seven contigs of a specific length, right? Um, we're going to uh, uh, total up all the lengths of these contigs. We get 50. Um, and then if we want to get halfway, uh, halfway to 50 is 25. We can figure out that if we take the 10 and the 12, the two top contigs, and we add them together, right, we're going to get a number bigger than 25. So then the N50 in this case is actually 12. And thus this value of 12 becomes the length of the contigs in which approximately 50% or more of the bases are held. So it's a measure of the content the contiguity of the uh, assembly that you've created. Um, but N50 is not um, a perfect tool um, because it values long things. You can encourage misassemblies. Um, it can overjoin them. Um, if we think about the previous example, you know, we might have eight and 12 joined together. Now we can look and say, oh yeah, look, their uh, N50 has gone up, right? Like it's gone up from 12 to 20. Um, and 
that might be good or that might be a misassembly where we kind of jammed 8 and 12 together and because our algorithm was biased towards that type of activity and now we have something that is not as good as it was before even though the N50 is higher. Um, there's another term that came out. We're going to talk a little bit more about the assemblathon coming up, but um, it's called NG50. And one of the nice things about NG50 is it dealt with um, some of the issues about N50. So it's kind of hard to use N50 in cases where the assembly, where the genome sizes differ dramatically. Um, that's because, uh, you know, the length of the expected contact will change based upon how big the genome is. Um, so to deal with that, this NG50 was created. Um, and this is saying, this sort of controls for um, those issues by saying, yeah, we're going to look for 50% of the estimated genome size um, to be in a contig of a specific length, right? So now everything is sort of scaled to the genome size for that organism. Now, say we get all the stuff, we do all these things, we measure our N50, um, are we done? Eh, I don't know. Uh, you know, there's a lot of other ways that we can think about validation that are important. Um, is it self-consistent? Uh, do we need a second opinion? Um, do we need to um, generate some sort of specific examination of, of specific errors or alignments in order to prove our point? Right, that may be true. It just remains to be seen. Um, I mentioned this earlier, but understanding the software issue is still a pretty significant one. Uh, if we think about all the different genome assembly softwares that are out there, um, understanding how to pick one can be get pro can be problematic. A lot of, can depend on the size of the genome, the hardware you have, the operating system you have, and how much budget you have to run things. Um, but it can be kind of a bit of a morass. Like, how do we make a decision? How do we pick one thing over the other? Right. Um, so there actually has been some effort to try to look at different assemblers and figure out which one works best. And uh, originally we referred to those endeavors as the Assemblathon. So the Assemblathon was actually a, a genome assembly competition, right? Um, that basically only involved bioinformaticians, so not really much physical exertion probably. Um, but it did spawn a sequel, Assemblathon 2, and then you know now we might have Assemblathon 3, um, which has recently been reported as now 77% certitude and rising. Um, there was a publish, a paper published by Assemblathon 2. This is published by uh, Keith uh, Bradnam back in 2013 about the results of this effort. Um, and basically what they did is they took some target species like birds and fish and snakes and uh, they decided, okay, we're going to sequence these things and we're going to all use our own tools to the best of our ability and let's see who can come up with the best sequence. So uh, we had the budgie, a leak Malawi cichlid, and a bow constrictor. So if we think about what they... The data they had for this, um, they all used the same data sets. Um, they had birds with a 1.2 gigabase, they had fish with a 1.0 gigabase, and they had snake with a 1.6 gigabase genome. And we had different information for different uh, exam exemplars here. So we had, uh, you know, a large section of Illumina, Roche, and Pac Bio associated with the bird, where when we did the, did the species, um, we did fish and snake, you know, we just were basically using Illumina data. So then to be about 21 teams in the assemblathon, we get three species, generated 43 assemblies and almost 5,500, uh, 52 gigabases of sequence. So remembering what our goals were, assess the quality of the genome assemblies, identify the best assemblers, and um, one of the first things we need to do is decide, define like what we thought quality was. Um, so I, I think an analogous question is you get asked people, you know, like, well, who makes the best the best pizza on Monterey Peninsula, 
And uh, it's an easy question to ask, but it's not as straightforward as it might seem. So, you know, say, you know, what are we gonna do? What are we gonna make our judgment on for the best pizza? The biggest, the cheapest, the delivery time, the freshest, the tastiest. What's the thing, you know, maybe if you are gluten free, right, best is going to be the one that doesn't have gluten in it. And that may not be the best for anyone else. So it's important that we understand like when we're picking things and calling them best or useful, a lot of that information may be somewhat subjective. Um, so, you know, if you are, we, even if you want to focus uh, just on the best tasting pizza, you know, that's going to be a pretty subjective approach. So you never know. Um, if you really got it or not. Um, so who makes the best genome assembler? Um, surely this couldn't be a subjective topic, right? Like we have to know the answer to this. Well, you know, what does it mean? Like just like the pizza, like how are you gonna judge this thing? What's the, what does it mean to generate the best assembly? Best at producing genes, easiest to install, longest scaffolds, lowest CPU demands. Um, few errors, fastest, you know, like these are all things that um, uh, help inhibit us moving forward. Um, if we can't figure out um, which is the question that we want to be answering. Um, so, you know, it's nice to be able to pick metrics, um, but they're still, while they're less subjective, there's still a certain amount of subjectivity in them. And I think it's just important to recognize that there's lots of different ways that we might measure success. So, you know, easiest to install is often the one that, that um, people will go with. So we may have a great assembler, but if you can't actually get it installed easily, uh, it's not going to inspire people to work with your product. So what are some of the metrics that we could come up to measure things with? Well, um, you know, there are some basic ones like the size of the assembly, the number of sequences, the number, uh, the N50 length of contigs and scaffolds, the NG50 length, um, the coverage, errors, number of genes, etc. Uh, it's really important that I'm interested in that, you know, when we're looking at these genome assemblies, it's not just one metric which is driving this process, it's multiple metrics. If you look at the results from the assembly thon, we can see that you know that most of them um, were pretty consistent in their estimates of genome assembly size. Two of them, M and A, uh, were uh, vastly different from what the expectation was. Uh, one was very very small, and the other one was very very large. Um, so it also indicates too that larger is not always better when it comes to genome assembly. Yeah. Um, one of the key areas that um, was used uh, to evaluate the quality of these genomes was to look for the presence and resequencing of core genes. So how good were, or, were um, organisms able to test for, for the presence, absence, and completeness of core gene sequence in, our, um, in these uh, genome sequencing files. These core genes are basically conserved um, orthologs that we would find in almost any metazoan or any group of organisms. So we look for them in the genome, we see, hey, we know these common features, where they actually sequence completely in order to estimate the completeness of the genome sequence. So um, initially, uh, the CORF lab developed this tool called Sigma to accomplish this task. Um, and uh, segment was about 248 uh, core eukaryotic genes. There are um, uh, a lot of full length um, of these core eukaryotic genes that we find when we do these comparisons. Um, but it'll tell us whether or not we got full sequence, whether we got partial sequence, or whether we didn't look for um, any sort of support um, in this sequencing effort by looking at these core genes. Um, and so if we did a perfect job, if there are 248 core genes, right, we'd expect to see them all present in these eukaryotes. Um, and so the lack of them can often mean um, um, an incomplete uh, genome sequence. And we can see that one of the things about uh, SEGMA and this, and this resequencing thing is that it doesn't really have a good relationship with con contiguity. Uh, so if we look at it in 50, there doesn't seem to be a very strong relationship between that and um, these core, the presence and absence and resequencing of these 
core eukaryotic genes. Um, so what happened to Sigma? Well, guess what? It wasn't actually all that easy to use. It was hard to um, use. So uh, uh, it became old and out of date. Um, but um, what it was is eventually um, it was going to be replaced by something else. So uh, Busco and Busco was developed um, to replace Sigma um, by some of the same authors. Um, Busco basically um, it's referred to as a benchmarking. It refers to a benchmarking universal copy, single copy ortholog, and um, uh, what Busco allows us to do is assess based on quantitative measures of evolutionary informed expectations of gene content from near universal single copy orthologs selected from the OrthoDB volume nine, currently on actually Busco version five from a software standpoint. And so uh, what this all this stuff means is basically we're using a set of um, orthologs, 400 and something, uh, much larger than the 248 used in Sigma to sort of be able to do some um, um, comparative uh, assessments of our genome assemblies. And these are all different data sets that you can choose. This is just a, a sample of them. You know, there's eukaryot, protists, metazoans, there's fish, there's plants, there's fungi. There's all different kinds of sets that you can look and test using these tools. And when your results will look something like this here, like the blue indicates um, a complete single copy sequence, right? You have the dark blue, which indicates a complete duplicated sequence. Um, the fragment analyze where you have the, um, how many fragments of these core eukaryotic genes do you have? And then also which number are missing. So it's nice to see this in this kind of plot. Um, obviously we'd love to see it all blue, but it can give you some really important information on how your um, work is progressing. So um, just know that there's lots of other tools to use for evaluating genomes. Again, you know, it just seems a little daunting that every time there's uh, you know a new assembler, we have to go out and evaluate it, and figure it out. So um, I do suggest coming up with a system that you think is good good for you. Um, just to point out that there's a whole bunch of Kamer tools that are also related to assessing quality, um, but I'm not really going to have time to talk about them today, so I'm, I'm planning on talking about them when we do that in class. Um, so let's get back to the results of assembly of Thon 2. So what have they found? Well, they had 102 metrics per assembly on average. They about had 10. They generated 10 key metrics that they developed for themselves, and they ended up with one final ranking. Right. Um, so this was an interesting process. Uh, the winner is uh, basically there was no winner in the assemblathon. So they put in all these rules and all this stuff, and there was no winner. Well, what do you mean that there was no winner? Well, it meant that some assemblers seemed to work well in one species, but maybe not another. Or they would work. There were some assemblers who would work good, or, or as measured by one metric, but not when measured by another. So they might fulfill one role, but not another, or they um, uh, they may seem to work, you know, have different idiosyncrasies about every species that some assemblers might work on and others might not. So this was a little bit disappointing to the people because um, many people hope they get a resounding endorsement for just, you know, one assembler, but it wasn't that simple. And we shouldn't have been surprised because it's a very complicated question. So, you know, say we're looking at something like number of core genes, we can see there's a wide range where, um, you know, we had our highest scoring groups here where they found basically all, almost all the core genes. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, we could take that and we could rank them um, and understand like, you know, which ones were better at finding um, these uh, core genes in their genomes versus others, right? So we use the same data, we assembled the thing and then did this kind of test. Uh, if we think about the snake assembly, right, and we looked at like which assembly we identified as being the best for snakes, um, you can see that the SGAT initially produced what looked to be like the queer winner for, for snakes, right? 
Um, but when we think about like what was the rank of the SGA assembly for all of the criteria, right? Well, it only scored fifth in the NG50. It only scored um, seven in the amount of assembly in the genome size scaffold. Um, it, it only signed fifth. It was only uh, ranked as fifth when it came to um, core genes uh, representation. So there's a lot of things that didn't go right in this assembly. So maybe that SGA is not the best one to use in this case. So even though it's first overall with assembly, there's lots of other things where its individual metric can get messed up. Um, as mentioned before, there's a lot of different types of technologies out there. Um, and, uh, you know, we're mostly going to be focused on uh, cases looking at Illumina, Oxford Nanopore, PacBio data. Um, one important thing to remember about your genome sequence, by, by the way, when you're dealing with it, is it's always important to look at your data. Um, you know, look at the distribution of lengths of your sequences, look at the percent ends, look at your data and figure out, you know, what it is you want to do and how you want to do it. Um, it can be very helpful in this process. If we think about where we're going when it comes to genome sequences, you know, um, there's, I think, uh, you know, here we have a paper by Nick Lohman's group where they, where they used nanopore sequencing to generate this genome sequence. I think that's probably one of the technologies of the future that we'll be using a lot more of. Another really important um, uh, methodology that's been developed over the past few years too is the Chicago and Hi-C methods that allow us to apply these whole chromosome level sequencing efforts um, using a method called Hi-C to our own data. Um, so this is, uh, for those of you don't, who don't remember or haven't seen these uh, min-ions before, this is an example of that. That's basically a DNA sequencer that fits in the palm of your hand. And if we think about the kinds of data that we will be implementing, right, you know, we're dealing with different types of data, phase genomics, dovetail genomics, uh, provide that high C data. 10X data um, is a way to sort of make sure a pool of sequences know um, what they should be working on. And then um, we've got Illumina, Nanopore, Pacific, Sci Pacific Biosciences, our sequencing companies, and BioNano, which um, generates optical maps. So um, as I pointed out before, um, I'm not going to talk as much about it, but I think the future really is um, related in things like the vertebrate genome pro assembly pipeline and project. Um, the vertebrate genome project, I think, is really going to do a lot to ad advance um, genomics. And uh, I'm really excited about the work that they're doing and think that they're going to have a really big impact. So I think over the future is where we're going. This is probably something that looks pretty, pretty much like the future. So what about a summary? Well, in conclusion, um, we've got genome assemblies. You know, they're, it's not a solved problem. Um, if possible, um, I would say that, you know, because it's not a solved problem, you don't know what the answer is, you're going to want to try to vary your answers as much as possible. Um, you can't rely just on one metric to assess quality. And um, it's important to understand that when you do look at metrics, that they're going to assess different aspects of quality in these different cases. And I think it's really important that you take some time and examine your genome. Make sure it, it is what it, what you hope it is and the, port, the parts that you assembled uh, are assembled well so that you can look at them that are important to you. Um, you know, the, the whole point is that uh, you want to be able to use this reference sequence as a reference for other things. And so making sure you did a good job of pulling it together is, is really important. So that was a little bit of a long one. Uh, thanks, everybody, for paying attention to this. And I look forward to seeing you and talking about this more and practicing in class. Take care.